Welcome to another very special episode of Sales Ops Demystified. We're joined by Corey Gaia of Sixth Sense. Now, Corey is someone who has very extensive experience across sales operations and now revenue operations at companies such as Aperio, if I'm saying that right. Um, you got it. <laughs> um, so between, close to five years there running sales operations um, and now more recently at Sixth Sense. So Let's dig into this. And Corey, um, how did you originally get into sales operations? Yeah, definitely, Tom. First of all, I'd like to say uh, thanks for having me. I, I think this is such a great forum. Uh, it's so easy to find podcasts on sales and how to be a good sales rep, how to be a good sales manager. Um, it's very difficult to find good podcasts on people that support sales uh, such as this. So thanks for putting this together. Uh, yeah, so um, I spent the first 13 years of my career in IT consulting, um, various roles, uh, carrying a bag, sales management, uh, running a practice, actually being a consultant. So all kinds of different um, uh, roles inside of IT consulting. So I definitely knew that business. And then at Aperio, which uh, is now owned by Wipro, and you know they're a, a large uh, kind of top Salesforce consulting firm, um, they were looking to build a sales ops and enablement function. And while I didn't have any direct experience, uh, they liked my background in both sales and in consulting. Um, and so they gave me a chance and kind of the rest is history. Awesome. So that was a new role that you joined. You weren't working there before. Um, they were recruiting like the fact that you had sales background and that you had this business experience and thought that was a good combination to, to bring you in. Yeah, they were new to, to sales operations and enable them that they didn't have a formal function like, like many growing organizations. You know, they're doing it in pockets across to finance and marketing and other roles. And so, um, you know, they liked the fact that I could kind of work cross-functional because I knew the business so well. Got it. And then because you were there for nearly five years, right? That's correct. Um, yeah. So, there were zero people in the sales ops team when you joined. And then when you left, how many people in the operations sales ops team and then how many reps or uh, AEs were you supporting? Yeah, at Aperio, uh, when I left, uh, there was nine people in sales operations and enablement. Uh, we had uh, kind of two people dedicated mostly on enablement. And then um, the other six people um, uh, kind of focus on operations, uh, kind of crossing the line a little bit into marketing ops in the sense of uh, sourcing a lot of different marketing data, helping to maintain data. Um, that was across uh, 80 quota reps. And then um, we also had in consulting, you have a role that's kind of focused on account management that's paired up with the reps too that also carry a quota. So all together about 120 people. Nice. Um, and then the move to six cents. Was that advertised to the revenue operations role or it was? Okay, cool. So what's yep. your rationale in, in shifting from sales operations to revenue operations? Well, I think, um, you know, if you, if you watch what's going on, um, whether you want to call it sales operations, marketing ops, you know, rev ops, rev acceleration, I think it's the new term I'm hearing now, uh, that uh, there's definitely going to be um, a blend across the entire revenue cycle. And so, especially in the B2B space, when you think about um, being very account-based, which is all what Sixth Sense does, you know, we have a platform for account-based sales and marketing uh, that, you know, it's, it's a very great area when it comes to what is sales versus what's marketing, what's success. And so it just kind of logically made sense. We are also starting the function, um, whether you want to call it sales operations or rev ops, we're starting the function. Um, I report to the head of sales. Uh, and that was kind of by design because we have, uh, you know, doing a lot of onboarding, doing a lot of ramping. We want to build a lot, a lot of systems, you know, sales productivity type systems. Um, the person that helped hire me was my former boss at Aperio, who's our CMO. So, um, you know, there's definitely a, 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 a tie there. Mm -hmm. And then we don't have an official um, revenue officer, CRO, um, today. So, you know, we're small, we're a highly collaborative team. And so... Um, I report to head of sales, have data line to marketing, as well as a data line to head of customer success. Sure. So um, it just kind of makes sense logically. We um, had a couple other people that do support um, kind of digital and demand and, and marketing ops um, that are starting to uh, fold and roll under me. Got it. And how many people in the off team versus how many reps? Again, same question. Uh, up, until, uh, up until two months ago, uh, it was just myself and a contractor. 
um, kind of tech support. Uh, now I recently hired two additional people, uh, one person to focus on enablement. We're doing lots of onboarding. So he's highly focused on onboarding both BDRs as well as AEs. And then uh, a second person to really focus on the tech stack. And um, we have open roles. We're hiring more. Um, in terms of reps, uh, we have 20 quota carrying AEs that are out in the field today. Um, when I started, that was nine people. So we've over doubled that in, in eight or nine months. And then um, uh, we have obviously our customer success team as well as pre-sales all together. Um, it's about 40, 45 people. Um, and then we are, you know, hiring as fast as we can, looking for good talent. So a little bit of advertisement, but I mean, we're looking to double um, all those roles really in the next 12 months. Got it. Um, and you mentioned we have a resource focused on tech stack. Could you quickly outline the six sense uh, approach to sales technology? Yeah. Well, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, we have, we have lots of tech. So, um, you know, we're, we're a B2B SaaS company, so we like our technology. Uh, we are Salesforce Sales Cloud for kind of all things sales. We have built a custom uh, Salesforce app for uh, customer success management. And so uh, that's managing all of our, our customer adoption plans and our use case management, things like that. We heavily use our own platform, Six Sense. And so just to break that down quickly, um, Territory planning, when we hire a new rep, you know, trying to figure out what are the right accounts to go after. Um, that's six cents. All the firmographics that we're doing. Um, doing kind of pro programmatic contact buys as part of a large, you know, sales or marketing campaign. We do that as well. Um, display ads, you know, falls under six cents. And then all of the uh, kind of account intent segmentation that we're doing is six cents. Uh, sales intelligence, kind of notifying sales, letting them know what's going on inside of that account. And then also all the sales orchestrations, kind of getting all that intent that's going on and then, you know, sending that over to like a sales loft. We use sales loft to be able to kick off cadences as well for, for BDRs and AEs. So that's six cents. You mentioned sales loft. We're using that for uh, prospecting and outreach, kind of running all those cadences. We do have a seamless, if you've heard of seamless.ai um, for kind of one-off contact research at the BDR level. Um, we're looking into other solutions uh, for that as well. LinkedIn sales and nav. I think that's kind of a um, table stakes anymore. Uh, Gong. Uh, we have Gong. Uh, Gong, by the way, was probably one of the um, easiest adoptions I've ever got. Um, mm -hmm. That's you know another side story, but um, uh, they had a lot of success with Gong for recording and kind of enablement and coaching. Uh, we we uh, just implemented Lessonly. For learning sales learning management, kind of onboarding, tracking, coaching, all inside of a learning management system. Um, we do have a tool called MediaFly um, that's an ROI calculation, kind of a value story tool. Um, we, we also are in the process of implementing um, Uberflip, Lean Data, and Salesforce CPQ. So I told you, you know, how long do you have? Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're a very, uh, our, our sales leadership team, really, um, understands the value of technology. Um, so uh, a lot of it comes kind of comes down to what's the highest priority need and really getting, making sure there's a strong sponsorship there uh, for um, this technology stack, both on the management side, as well as the rep side, you know, early on during the evaluation process of these tech uh, technologies and as well as even kind of piloting early on. Um, so, you know, we look at lots of different technology. Uh, we'll mention that, um, you know, looking forward, we are um, starting to explore, like, how can we get more disciplined around deal management, deal health, kind of deal analytics, um, you know, kind of strategic account planning, things like that. So um, that's kind of in the horizon, you know, three to six months out, we're starting to look at those types of solutions. Got it. A very comprehensive tech stack. Um, moving on to data quality, is that, I assume that fits with your team, so data quality and Salesforce. Um, what are you currently doing to maintain or improve the data you have in the CRM? Well, we built quite a culture around data hygiene at the sales level. Um, you know, we have the luxury of our own platform because, you know, we are a data company. We're kind of a big data and AI company. And so uh, all of our reps, when they start, when they're interviewed, they're, they understand the value of data. That kind of starts at the account level, account and contact level, trying to help maintain that data. So that's the first and foremost thing. I think um, you've had uh, you know other people on your podcast that really talk about the importance of that, and I would totally agree. 
Um, also then kind of from a back end standpoint, we do have a tool um, use, you know, there's lots of tools out there, but we use cloud dingo for kind of account merging and um, converting leads and that type of thing. Uh, we are also in the process of trying to figure out, like get a data team going. And so, uh, you know, whether that is a full-time kind of data analyst we hire internally, you know, there's other um, uh, solutions out there. You know, there's a company called DataBees that we're researching um, that has kind of a whole, uh, you know, set of data analysts out there that you can kind of hire on demand. So um, that is also something we're looking at com- from kind of the back-end standpoint. Got it. Um, and then moving on to, I, I really like what you said about building the culture around data hygiene. Moving on to the the way you work with the sales team. And I guess the question is, how are you able to build the culture and incentivize the sales team to do that work, which could be viewed as for you, not necessarily for them? Yeah, this is... Um what I like to do is really get the actual rep to be involved in the valuation process. Um, and so I'll, I'll pick on gong only because, uh, that is, um, you know, I mentioned that one earlier, but, uh, when we were evaluating that there's lots of different solutions when you look at, um, kind of recording and, and, um, enablement solutions of, of, you know, recording those calls and, uh, Gong made it very easy to, um, you know, to kind of demo to all the reps. We, we stood up a pilot. And in fact, when we ran this pilot for 30 days, um, all before any type of contracts getting signed, uh, you know, we had our sales reps coming back to us saying, you know, we cannot turn this off. Really? So, um, so I think like, you know, I realize that's, you know, maybe exception to the rule. Like it's hard to get that with a lot of solutions. But if you think forward to something that reps hate, like configure price quote, building estimates, all that stuff, um, when we're looking at rolling that out, we're going to take a similar approach. So trying to really get a couple reps that are senior reps, you know, reps that are really liked in the organization, and trying to get them to, to actually help deliver the training, help talk about why they're excited about the solution. Um, so that's that's first and foremost. The other thing I would say is, constant communication. Uh, we have a luxury that we hold all sales hand calls every single Monday. And so we're always doing a little bit of a showcase into um, a given process or a given uh, uh, technology that we think needs more attention, as well as uh, always sending out Slack updates. You know, So uh, here's a good example of how a rep got benefit out of using this solution. So just kind of that constant drip of communication. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, and then what are we doing to make the reps more productive at the moment? Well, we're, um, I mentioned that we're really trying to onboard lots of reps. So maybe we start there with just onboarding and uh, we are in the process of building out kind of a comprehensive, like 12 week, you know, typical 12 week type onboarding program. A lot of that does involve um, self-paced training. So we've taken a lot of content that we've created really in the last six months um, various boot camps we've held and those weekly calls we've held where we just record them and we're chunking those up into um, self-paced learning content that reps go through as well as um, making sure we kind of have clear milestones. So at this point, we want you to do role play and certification on this topic or have this many calls reviewed um, by your manager. So really identifying kind of clear milestones, most importantly, um, uh, getting those tracks so that way m- their managers reminded, hey, it's time to do A, B, and C. And so we found that really it's that that manager interaction that we can kind of help facilitate and enable it um, that really drives the best productivity. Got it. And yeah, I think that's super. It's like you're giving the tools to the manager to help improve the productivity. Yeah, that's a nice. Yeah. Obviously, if the team scales, it's going to be hard for the sales team to improve the productivity of 50 or so reps. So that's a really nice point. Um, can we quickly talk about forecasting? Um, what is the forecasting process at the moment? And what is the sales ops team role in that process? Yeah, we, um, we have three different uh, sales teams, field teams. They uh, meet weekly as a team. Uh, led by their manager, and it's really the manager's responsibility to kind of uh, trust the, that data that's getting entered into the forecast. We use Salesforce Collaborative Forecasting as a solution, and the manager does have the opportunity to, to provide their own override. 
um, from a week to week standpoint. And then we do meet the following Monday as a leadership team to review that and kind of challenge each other. Um, that is, you know, the current quarter. Uh, we're, we're starting to look at for future quarters, how we can actually just be more predictive from a pure data standpoint. Uh, we had a lot of success in doing this at a period where we would uh, kind of triangulate um, things like uh, pipe coverage that we have for that period, quota coverage, you know, attainment rates, and kind of triangulate uh, different metrics like that to come up and predict within, you know, plus and minus 20% a future quarter. Because oftentimes it's hard to rely directly on the deal data for future periods. Got it. Um, and then next, I want to talk about the KPI for you that you're measuring. And actually, the question I'd like to ask is from your extensive experience in sales ops, what has been a really valuable or insightful metric? Yeah, the um, uh, there's been some really good ones. I've listened to a lot of the podcasts from other guests mm -hmm. you've had, some really, really good ones. Um, I love the one that uh, I, we're not doing this today, but I love the one where um, a, a guy, a gentleman you had on was talking about um, measuring the um, uh, individual uh, attainment, rate, attainment rates by reps at the manager level. You know, the count yeah, of reps yeah. that have hit, that was, that was great. Um, that's great one. insight. Uh, one big one that we're, we're focused on, that we're seeing a lot of value on from a ramped rep perspective, okay, is um, deal velocity. Cool. And so we've done a lot of analysis on um, you know, our, our various stages, we have a methodology similar to like medic. And so, uh, we sit there and say, okay, from stage zero, uh, all the way up to stage two, which is qualified. Um, we know that the best deals go through, um, in X amount of days and then each stage on, you know, on forward. So we can track all that. We actually put that directly into the forecast app. So when you're looking at, um, that, you know, uh, that deal, you can actually have the manager analyze that as well as we're notifying reps when um, deals, you know, quote unquote, become at risk purely off velocity. So you can imagine it'd be even more powerful um, if you would combine that plus like relationship health, like activity flow back and forth mm -hmm. um, would start to get really powerful. Got it. So you're saying that the manager during the, the forecasting meeting can see the velocity of each deal in the forecast and therefore ask questions based on the fact that you know if a deal hasn't got to stage two in seven days then it's unlikely to get to stage three that's right that's and correct yeah and oh, you guys. yeah and, and just to mention uh one or two on the onboarding side too because that is really important for us i think a lot of, a lot of companies that are growing right now is um uh, another guest you had on talked about some onboarding metrics a couple that we closely like to watch is time to first deal that they source. The key part of that is that they source because, um, you know, obviously a rep could come in that's replacing a recent termed rep, take on some active deal cycles, and they can close us pretty quickly and they're already halfway down the cycle. So, you know, a, a deal that they actually source themselves, it's net new. And then um, the second metric is um, the time it takes them to reach to um, their fully uh, ramped quota for that first quarter. So, you know, take a simple example, let's say a fully ramped quota for a rep is 100K. How long does it take them to get to 100K? And, you know, when you combine those two metrics, kind of average them out, um, that's a good way to look at ramp time. Got it. And so that is, so you can then take all of the ramping reps and then rank them, I guess, by those two metrics. And then these people here may need a bit more work on Nice. Yep. Yeah, very definitely. Cool. Um, okay, cool. So final question. Who in the sales ops or revenue ops world has uh, inspired you or taught you the most? Yeah, well, um, I would say in terms of really helping me understand the space and, and really take the time and patience to kind of coach me is, um, is Chris Heineken. Uh, Chris was head of sales at Aperio. Uh, he's also the guy that took a chance on me. Uh, Chris, Chris really taught me that, um, you know, you really need to make everything simple. You know, us, us folks in operation, we like to get into the nitty gritty and everything else. And, and Chris is really an expert at um, when it comes time to communicate and try to get adoption, um, make it as simple as possible. 
And he was always working with me on that. Uh, and Chris has now went on to start his own company um, after Aperio and, and having a lot of success. Uh, I would also say, probably moving forward, I'm really interested in just all the kind of innovation that's happening around enablement and productivity. And a couple of leaders, I think, that are in that space that I closely follow, that I'd love to get FaceTime with, um, is a guy like Corey Bray. He's wrote lots of books and has lots of content on enablement, as well as uh, Eli Cohen, uh, Saleshood, you know, book. And, you know, he has a whole company around enablement at this point. Fantastic. Well, let me pick out a few things. Um, I think it might have been the first time we heard the word culture around data or culture of data quality or, or data, data hygiene. And I think that really sums up what the, the majority of people's answers to that question about how you need to, how everybody's responsible for data quality, right? And you do that by having a this uh, culture or this belief that everybody has to do that. So I like that little point. Um, including reps in procurement of new tools, because when you then get them, they, they've been bought into the process from the start. And then the final point was about having, instead of potentially trying to improve reps' individual productivity, give the managers or equip the managers uh, with the tools to facilitate the productivity for their reps. I think that's a, a powerful strategy as well. So, Corey, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it.